Chapter 7 Germany Revolution, according to Joseph Goebbels, in brackets 1897 to 1945, end brackets, can be defined as, in quotations, a process which, with its own dynamism and its own standards, tries to instill into the state the dynamism and standards which were until then the preserve of the opposition, end quotations. It would be the purpose of National Socialist Revolution to breathe new life into the German state by reaffirming its connection with the people whose expression it was meant to be, and by establishing this upon a mixture of concrete measures and of myth which for some years at least persuaded many Germans that they were living in an extraordinary adventure. The collapse of the Kaiser's empire in 1918, the collapse of the German mark in the early and middle 20s, the inflation which destroyed all savings, stocks, and state bonds had turned the mass of the German middle class, in brackets, so disciplined, so scrupulous, class conscious, and law-abiding, end brackets, into economically and socially displaced persons. The depression which hit Germany as the 20s ended knocked the last nail into the coffin of a disintegrating order. By 1932, a country of 65 million had 6 million unemployed and 21 million living wholly or in part on charity or relief. In this swarming mass of unemployed, the ruined, in quotations, bourgeois, end quotations, and, in quotations, sometime bourgeoisified proletarians, end quotations, were united by a common helplessness and exasperation that drove them into the ranks of the extremist parties, be they communists or national socialists. Hitler and the Nazis. The latter movement had been born in post-war Munich, among a crowd of ephemeral anti-communist groups, and was named the German Workers' Party, in brackets, see reading number 2A, end brackets. In September 1919, still only a half dozen strong, the German workers were joined by the man who made them famous, Adolf Hitler, in brackets, 1889 to 1945, end brackets. As an impoverished youth in the Vienna of Leuger and Franz Josef, Hitler had made up his mind to rise above a proletariat which he despised for dragging through the mud, in quotations, the nation, the fatherland, and the authority of the laws, end quotations, and to transcend a time, in quotations, favorable only to merchants and quill drivers, end quotations where misery coexisted with the luxury of the business and noble classes, and with the antediluvian pomp of the Habsburg court. The way to counter the injustice and decay that young Hitler saw in Vienna was not the one preached by the followers of Marx, for Marxism was no better than death, a, in quotations, vitriolic, end quotations, doctrine of selfishness and hatred, and since the Austrian Marxists and much of the Austrian press were said to be led by Jews, the Jewish people seemed to Hitler the carriers of Marxian decay, a 20th century variant of what he saw as their secularly destructive role. The feeling that the Jews were a foreign body in all societies and hence destructive would reach in Hitler a pitch of intensity usually associated with madness. In quotations, if the Jew with his Marxism were to win, the earth would become a planet bare of men as it was millions of years ago. End quotation. Although the fierceness of his beliefs disgusted some, it seems to have had a convincing effect on others, helping to turn his arguments into invocations, the more impressive for being less coherent and closed to critical examination. The outbreak of the First World War found Hitler in Munich, where, thanking heaven on his knees for letting him live in such times, he volunteered for the Bavarian infantry in which he found the fighting, in quotations, unforgettable and sublime, end quotations. The end of the war found him decorated and wounded several times. Back in Bavaria, his eloquence, his violent patriotism, and his fanatical hatred of Marxists, Jews, and parliamentary institutions won him sympathies in certain largely reactionary political and military quarters, horrified by the very moderate social democracy of Weimar. They would have been more horrified by the agitator whom they helped to notoriety, in brackets, for Hitler alone had helped himself to power, end brackets. The people that Hitler gathered around him were far more radical than either the conservative gentry or the almost equally conservative trade unionists whom his followers were to displace. 
to the apocalyptic promises of communist revolution, the National Socialists opposed an apocalypse of their own, capable of galvanizing the disillusioned and the desperate into a unity for which they yearned. The faith that held them together was based on the three ideas of race, folk community, and leadership. The Leader and the Race Racial theories are not peculiar to National Socialism. In brackets, see reading number 2, C, and brackets. Partly as a byproduct of 19th century ideas of national selection, partly under the impact of equally 19th century attempts to combine history and sociology in would-be scientific theories, a great many Germans, in brackets, including Jewish intellectuals like Walter Rathenau, and brackets, had come to believe in the existence of, in quotations, races, end quotations, with different inherent moral and physical characteristics, and also in the superiority of northern or Aryan peoples. This superiority could only be affirmed and maintained if the characteristics and the purity of the race were not adulterated, as those of Germanic peoples had unfortunately been for a long time by foreign influences and foreign blood. The race had now to be purged of pernicious elements by which it had allowed itself to be infiltrated, and German salvation lay in the recapture, in brackets, or achievement, end brackets, of the ideal biological type in which the German race could find fulfillment. The roots and inspiration for such a revival, a return to the nation's vital sources, could be rediscovered in the secular folk community that blood, soil, and history had created and in the institutions which peculiarly German conditions had forged, religious, social, and economic. The Germans were anarchic and divided because they lived in an artificial society that had lost all sense of community in its institutions and in its laws. A new consciousness of common race, the true democracy of a revived corporative order, would reunite them. But the unifying factor par excellence would be the person of the leader, upon whom all aspects of the faith could focus. The leader does not hold his position because of any particular intellectual or moral superiority, but by a mystic pre-selection. He is not so much the representative of his people as its medium. Ideally, the leadership principle should be applied at every level in a great cat's cradle of relationships in which each group, in brackets, families, schools, factories, professions, end brackets, has its leader, all finding place in a great pyramid of responsibilities and loyalties topped by the national leader. The group cannot be fully united, fully effective, fully itself, without the leader who helps it to crystallize, just as he himself is nothing without the group. So the two can only prosper and rise together. The members of the group give up their personal freedom to follow the leader, but gain in effectiveness as a group and in the satisfaction of their will to power, more than they lose as private agents. The relationship is not recorded in a contract, not even reflected in a reasoning process, but similar to the selection of pirate and robber chiefs, or that of certain military castes in which a bond of honor and mutual devotion unites the leader to the men he leads. The notion of race evoked familiar echoes in the minds of the German bourgeoisie. That of the folk community had the attraction of a certain romantic socialism, the last that of the leader, fused all this in a group relationship and a hierarchy based on virtues different from those on which position in society heretofore depended. A new, biological democracy, in brackets, what one of Rathenau's killers called, in quotations, plebiscitary mass democracy, end quotations, end brackets, would take the place of the unreal and ineffective order where no one was really equal because unfair moral, intellectual, or economic differences set them apart. The Nazi Siegfried looked back to the equalitarian elitism of Sparta, to the barracks of the Prussian army, to the ideals of a classless society that some French revolutionaries had entertained. In the new order, not property but physical excellence would make for the superiority. Not class, but comradeship, would provide the basis of the new peer groups. Not contract, but confidence would create the texture of social and political relationships. 
The party creates the conditions in which the Siegfried may be born and thrive. It also manipulates the machinery of the state, which appears in turn as, in quotations, the secular arm of the German community, end quotation. The community judges the state by its plebiscites. The state must form its policies to express the profound tendencies, in quotations, the general will, end quotation, of the nation, and the nation is purified, educated, and trained by the party. The party state must intervene in every aspect of public and private life, in brackets, hence the totalitarian state, end brackets, because, as Carl Schmidt writes, in quotations, any activity is potentially political and thus subject to political decisions, end quotations. And, furthermore, in quotations, it is as a political animal that man can be grasped in his totality and his existential essence, end quotation. These were the theories which, after 1930, would attract millions of German voters to the Nazi side. As the Nazi regime progressed, the distinction between civil and military society grew less. The German people were increasingly enlisted in a pan-German crusade not only at the expense of the Jews, but also of other groups or institutions, in brackets, especially religious, end brackets, with particularist claims whose influence might affect the Nazis' monopoly in training the German soul for the fulfillment of its destiny. The opposition that such encroachments met was slight. The soldiers saw in the mobilization of the nation a source of power for themselves, the businessmen a source of profits, the bureaucrats the fulfillment of their dreams of total organization. Gradually, in quotations, fundamental laws, end quotation, created the, in quotations, unitary, authoritarian, popular, end quotations, state that Hitler had in mind. The Reichstag, which met seldom and then only to endorse official policy, was completely subordinated to the government, which combined executive and legislative power. Between the leader and the nation, said the doctrine, a bond exists. The leader must act to fulfill his duties and account to the people for what he has done. The people must endorse or reject his policies in direct consultations. Meanwhile, the party, depositor of the fundamental principles of National Socialism present at every level of administrative, professional, and family life, served as a continuous means of contact, applying the directives of the leader, but also keeping him apprised of the popular mood. Organized Autarchy Forceful but didactic, the Nazi conquest of Germany was relatively gradual. This appears most clearly in the handling of economic problems which affected every aspect of German life. To come to power legally as leader of the most numerous party in the Reichstag, in brackets, before it became the only one, end brackets, Hitler combined the destruction of the political structure which he found, in brackets, dissolution of political parties, taking over of the unions, unification of the Federalist Republic by suppression of local sovereignties, and establishment of a central national administrative and police structure, end brackets, with a socio-economic policy more cautious than Nazi theory implied. The Nazi's economic theorist, Gottfried Feder, had postulated the suppression of interest, in brackets, and thus of private credit transactions, end brackets, Nationalization of great enterprises, control of smaller ones, state financing of great public works destined to apply the rule that everyone had both the duty and the right to work, and a self-sufficient socialist economy, divorced from the influence of private capital, whether German or foreign. The electorate had seemed to like these ideas, but big business naturally did not. Nor would German industry have benefited from an approach that favored small and medium enterprises. Such concepts, therefore, were soon abandoned, and Hitler adopted more empirical policies. The results of the new economic policies, under the able direction of Dr. Schacht, and with the power of a forceful and stable state, were impressive. Over 6 million unemployed in 1933 were reduced to 4 million in 1934, 2.9 million in 1935, and 300,000 in 1938. National revenue rose from 45 billion marks in 1932 to 61 billion in 1936. 
National production increased from about 38 billion marks in 1932 to about 75 billion in 1938. In brackets, during which time the general production index passed from 52 to 96. End brackets. The volume of trade rose 25% between 1935 and 1939. Nor did the production of guns unduly hamper the production of butter, whose consumption rose from 483,000 tons in 1932 to 600,000 tons in 1938, while that of fats, in general, rose correspondingly. But it is worth remembering that if Fader's ideas were relegated to ideological discussions, over the years the tendency of the empirical measures in whose favor they had been set aside was in his direction. Interest would never be eliminated, nor would the profit motive, but the state which held nearly 70% of the capital of German banks controlled their activities as it did those of heavy industry by its great holding companies. Import, exchange and price controls allowed the Ministry of National Economy to direct production, distribution, and consumption. Investments would be regulated by the great professional boards that functioned within the complicated structure of the corporate state. Some enterprises were nationalized, other nationalized enterprises were created, no new firms could be set up without special permission. In a short time, a great part of the population had been reintegrated into the production circuit, both as producers and consumers, with full employment making a reality of the right to work and voluntary, in brackets, eventually compulsory, end brackets, labor for the young, making it a duty. In The Decline of the West, published in 1917, Oswald Spengler had called on German youth to turn their backs on the effet refinements of decaying civilization and to adopt a peculiarly German morality of effort and of work. No longer the object of haggling or of contracts, a man should treat his work as a joyous, voluntary community service. Working for the community, that is, for themselves, men could accept the necessary disciplines of work as self-imposed and view their labor's product as a common gain. This was very well, if workers could be shown that the product of their labors did in fact benefit them, and Nazis made great efforts to succeed in this. One of the duties of the labor front, in brackets, which incorporated the tasks of the old unions, and brackets, was to provide satisfactions and rewards for every class of worker. In brackets, e.g., the well-known and ridiculously inexpensive holidays and cruises of, in quotations, strength through joy, end quotation, end bracket. On the eve of war, the labor front was spreading its activity into every sphere, from sport and travel to socialized medicine, in brackets, already existent in Germany, end brackets, and labor courts. In 1938 alone, factory social services sponsored by the Front as part of its activities employed 26,000 doctors, sent 600,000 children to the countryside, and paid maternity allowances to 150,000 mothers. A first step towards the autarkic economy which Fader advocated had been taken in 1931, when Germany had established exchange control and removed its currency from free international circulation. Soon after taking power, the National Socialists completed this particular move by abandoning the gold standard and basing the mark's rate on its commercial value in the international market, that is, the demand for marks by people wanting German services and goods. Such a step implied either a favorable trade balance or a trade policy largely based on barter. Both were tried. In 1933, the figure of imports and exports had fallen respectively from the 1,120 and 1,124 million marks of 1929 to 350 and 400 million. By 1939, the relevant figures were 456 and 493 million marks. Trade volume had risen 25% since 1935. Exports were exceeding imports, and the situation was healthy enough. In the vital sphere of foodstuffs, although Germany remained dependent on imports for fats, fodders, and colonial products, imports of agricultural produce had fallen from 30% of the total in 1932 to only 17% in 1938, as fallow lands were halved and farmers were given every encouragement to grow more. Meanwhile, 
important barter agreements had been signed with a number of countries in Eastern Europe and overseas, which furnished essential raw materials. The German economy faced serious problems, in brackets, arising largely from increased consumption, end brackets, but its capacity of solving these problems also improved. It may be that the obsession with self-sufficiency provided an argument for Hitler's policy of conquest, but the argument by itself cannot have been a major one. The needs for self-sufficiency that his policy implied did, however, lead, especially after the resignation of Dr. Schacht, in 1938, to the hardening and progress of state direction as well as regulation of the country's economic life. Henceforth, Article 1 of the Notorious Decree of December 1, 1936 would be put into practice. In quotations, Any German resident who, consciously or unconsciously, moved by base selfishness or by whatever vile sentiment, contravenes legal rules and causes grave prejudice to German economy, may be condemned to death and his fortune confiscated. End quotation. By 1943, the money market as motor of industrial activity had been replaced by the state's planning organizations, the vestiges of capitalism by a planned economy which, unlike in the West, fitted perfectly with national socialist conceptions, being only the fulfillment of earlier moves. The, in quotations, German socialism, end quotations, soft-pedaled in the middle 30s, was again coming into its own in the form of state capitalism. Political and economic pressures were forcing the Nazis to affirm it at the expense of the business and capital interests they had begun by trying not to offend too much. Apart from obsessive fanaticism and from the resentment of middle-class business and professional men against their abler, more successful Jewish competitors, Anti-Semitism appeared in the 1930s as an ideal outlet for the anti-capitalist tensions of the mob which the Nazis themselves had done so much to rouse. But once the Jewish minority was eliminated, the essence of that, in quotations, vagabond and cosmopolitan fortune, end quotation, which it suited the Nazis to identify with the Jews would be exposed as something else and something more, far more than Jewish. On the other hand, the Nazi power would feel strong enough to challenge it head-on. There seems to be little question that, as happened in Italy, the grip of the dynamic totalitarian state would not have spared the private interests which had helped it secure power. In the event, the Nazis did not win. But at the very moment of defeat, the doctrinaire quality of their beliefs stood out most sharply. Over and over again, the primacy of doctrine over pragmatic logic kept the Germans from using their hard-pressed resources to the full. It was, to an important extent, principle that kept them from using Russian, especially Ukrainian, hostility against the communists as they might. It was the same insane principles which used rolling stock the army needed to ship Jews and gypsies to their slaughter. The Germans were waging a religious war. They benefited from the fervor this provided. They also paid its price. Nations in our time seem caught in a strange dilemma. Without a cause to fight for, they see little reason to fight, even to defend themselves. Persuaded that in the end, merely material gains hardly outbalance the possibility of death. Only a faith will keep men together in great stress or make them brave great dangers. But for a faith, men will do the most savage things. No beastliness is worse than that which great ideals seem to justify in their perpetrators' eyes. The Germans murdered a people for a dream. A strange dream which fanatical purpose turned to nightmare. And this is the paradox we find in all these movements born in crisis. The crisis calls for action, but also for more than action. It calls for a faith which will make violent and sustained action possible a faith which will instill the state with the dynamism and standards that we associate more with the opposition, in quotations, the party of movement, end quotations, than with the party in power, which generally guards an established order. But then this faith, in turn, may lead to crimes. And if, as in the case of Hitler, the faith is limitless, both in its undefined aims and in its force, then there need be no end to crimes which are not carried out for a limited purpose, so that, once attained, the crimes themselves may cease, 
but must go on making bloody history forever.